First, thanks for doing this, sure. speaking with us. We appreciate it. You bet. Uh, first, I just want to talk about the speed of this case. Mm -hmm. You know, these murders happened just three months ago in August. This case is now already wrapped up with the, the plea and the sentencing today. How unusual is it to have such a high-profile case wrap up so quickly? Oh, I think it's very unusual. I, I can't really speak to the speed from the, from the dis defense side, what their, um, their thought process was. I think that once we had an arrangement or an agreement where the death penalty was taken off the table, I think that makes it all the more likely that it is going to resolve that quickly. But um, I talked to Shanann's family after this today and I said, you know, I hope this gives a little bit of closure. It was fast, but anything we can do to try to get them on the road to healing is, is important. And so from that perspective, I, I appreciate the fact that it got done this quickly. So I'm going to cover your time. Oh, sure. No worries. I don't know this for a fact, but there's probably more people than you've seen in a courtroom in Weld County before in terms of how many people were out in the hallways and in the overflow room and, mm -hmm. and so many emotions in that courtroom. What was it like to just be a part of that today and how much, how, uh, you know, how much stock goes into making sure those emotions don't go overboard with sure. the courtroom? We had a lot of conversations about the different things that could go wrong, the different obstacles. Um, it went exceptionally smoothly. Um, I think that the overflow courtroom and the number of people that, that were here today um, demonstrates the important, importance that this case had to this community. Um, from the very beginning, um, on August 13th, this is, has been a case that has absolutely rocked, not just Frederick, but the, you know, the surrounding towns, the entire community. And um, I think we saw that in the courtroom today. Judge Kopkow called Watts' actions in the courtroom today the most inhumane he had seen in 17 years as a judge. In this case, or are these actions the most inhumane you've seen as a prosecutor? I've been a prosecutor for 21 years, and I couldn't possibly imagine anything worse than what we saw in this. Not just the, the fact that this man annihilated his family, but to have the utter disrespect for their remains by dumping them in oil tanks and burying them out in eastern Colorado um, really is, is something that um, shocked the conscience of all of us. This case, Chris Watts will spend the rest of his life in prison, but he could have faced the death penalty here. If his family had wanted you to pursue the death penalty, would you have? That's a tough question. Um, they were so adamant that they did not want me to seek the death penalty that uh, that really drove our discussions and our, our thought processes from the very beginning. Had it been different, had they come to me and said, absolutely, we want you to seek the death penalty, no ifs, ands, or buts, I probably would have. I, I put more stock in, in the, the desires, the beliefs, the, the, the family views on what we do in a case like this than anything else. Um, I met with all our law enforcement partners. I met with the defense. I met with um, the sheriff's office. I met with supervisors in my office. But I met with her family first because I knew that every meeting that I would go to would ask me, well, what does the victim's family want? Um, and that's really what drove our decision. As recently as last year, though, I know Governor Hickenlooper indicated he was open to commuting the death sentence of, of Nathan Dunlap, who shot and killed the four employees at the Chuck E. Cheese in Aurora. And Governor Elect Polis has said that he would uh, vote for a bill, uh, sign a bill to abolish the death penalty in Colorado. Would that have weighed in, though? You, you've kind of referred to that mm -hmm. before, to your decision. Oh, sure. It absolutely did weigh into our decision because we had to have a conversation with Shanann's family about. Um, the, the reality is that we could go out and seek the death penalty, get the death penalty, and, and, and ha at some point have a governor or a legislature who abolished the death penalty and all it all would be for naught. Um, we knew that this was a contentious election year um, here in Colorado. No one knew what the, for certain what the outcome was going to be, and I had to talk with, with her family about that as well. Um, so that certainly played a role in some of the decision making as well. In your career, have you ever encouraged a family to seek the death penalty? No, I don't think that's my role to encourage them ever. Um, I think that that is extremely personal to each family, and I honestly want them to tell me exactly what they want. I don't want to persuade them one way or another. Because this case brings up the whole question about the death penalty, mm -hmm. I mean, as a prosecutor, would you, would you support the state abolishing it? No, I am a strong supporter of the death penalty. Chris Watts was certainly eligible for the death penalty. I think the death penalty um, is on the books currently for defendants just like him. 
At the same time, I recognize the realities. Nathan Dunlap, as you talked about, is still alive. He was convicted more than 20 years ago. When I have a mom who is sitting across the table from me in her kitchen saying, please don't do this, I can't be a part of the criminal justice system for the next 20 years, awfully tough for me to say, I understand your feelings, but I'm going to do it anyway. Are you a father? I am a father. How did this case impact you personally as a father? Terribly. Um, we have a little girl at home. She's three years old and she has blonde hair, just like the victims in this case. And so I would come home after um, working on this case all day and we'd see her bouncing around in the living room and my thoughts immediately went to Bella and Celeste. Um, even beyond that, I can't fathom what went through a man's mind when he is not just killing his wife, but killing his children. Um, senseless doesn't even begin to describe what he did. It's just sickening. Did any part of you think that Chris Watts would speak at today's sentencing and, and explain why he did what he did? I didn't think he would. I called him out. I did that intentionally as I was preparing my remarks. I wanted to see if I could get him tell the truth, give the family, not just Shanann's family, give his own family some answer to the question of why. But at the same time, I knew that even if he did that, it would ring so incredibly hollow. Um, there's no explanation for what he did that can, can satisfy that desire to know why in anyone. And his family, his parents were asking him to do that. Do you think at some point he will? No, I don't. I, I think he heard those pleas from, from me, from his family. I don't think, based on what I know and what we've seen in the investigation, that he will ever bring himself to tell us what happened. I know this is hypothetical, but had Chris Watts not confessed in this case, how tight was this case? I mean, was there a lot of evidence out there? Because I know that as far as the, the murders, there, there wasn't a lot. There was a lot of circumstantial evidence that really, I think, was strong evidence. When law enforcement shows up right at the outset, based on this call from her friend Nicole, saying, I need you to come check on the welfare of Shanann, when her car is there, her purse is there, her cell phone is there, the house is locked up from the inside in a way that no one could lock a door and run out a garage door, for example. The key code on the garage door didn't work. There was no way for a stranger to get in there, abduct them or anything else, um, signal to us that it probably, at, at that early stage, probably was a family member, probably was um, the defendant. But then you start to really look at the manner in which they were killed, where their bodies were dumped, um, his familiarity with that area, and I think there were a lot of pieces that could be put together even without him talking, but it certainly made it a much stronger case because he ultimately did give us at least a version of, of what he wanted us to believe, even though we know all of it wasn't the truth. Do you think he's a psychopath or sociopath? And I don't know if he was actually examined and, and diagnosed at any point. If he was, I don't know. Obviously, I don't have the ability to ask for that. Um, from a clinical standpoint, I don't know. There is certainly something wrong with a guy who annihilates his family for a new love affair. There's something wrong with him. Um, again, from a clinical or insanity standpoint, certainly not. There were no signs of that at all. But how do you do this? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've been a part of several big cases, but is this one at the top of your list in terms of what you'll remember? I will never forget this case. This is at the top of the list of horrifying things that we have seen people do to each other. I felt like that. Okay. If you want to get a few, kind of wait. Yeah, like, stay here for a minute. Sure.